Mostly I do work with people who are freelance. It is, it is mainly because the biggest part of what I do for people is working out their income and expenses, which uh, is kind of a whole area that, that like the normal people don't really, <laughs> let's hear it for the normal people with jobs and stuff, um, uh, don't actually have to, to do. I, I don't really understand why people who are not in business for themselves are scared of taxes, because it's so easy for them. And it's so hard for freelance people because we've got so much more work to do, but it'll be fine. <laughs> Show. Um, so yeah, um, I actually I love doing talks like this. I, I really do because um, uh, I think it's the, you get the captive audience to make everybody just relax. It's it's not as bad as you think. It really isn't. And uh, kind of this is what I'm here to do for you. We're gonna talk a little bit about the main things, ignore the mistakes thing, forget the experience. <laughs> We're gonna talk about the main issues that people tend to ask me about. There's gonna be time at the end for question and answer. We are starting a little bit early, so there'll be like lots of Q&A time, and there's always a lot of questions that breed more questions. Um, and, and here's the thing. Uh, uh, I, <laughs> there's, there's the answer that I would give in private, and the answer that I will give in public. Oh well, you know, most of the most of the time it's the same. I mean, most of the time it's the same. I believe in the tax system. I really do. I believe in paying taxes. I believe in the social safety net. I believe and I understand why CRA does things the way they do, and for the most part, I agree with what they do. Uh, but there's every now and then there's the difference between what is supposed to be done and what is realistic. And uh, sometimes even CRA agrees that those aren't really the same thing and they're kind of cool with it, but I don't talk about that when I'm being videoed. <laughs> so if you do have any questions about anything I present tonight, um, you can email me or speak to me on the phone. Uh, I give any kind, of, any kind of answer I can give you over the phone or by email, uh, uh, I will do that free of charge. I, I really don't mind. Just Call, email, whatever. You got a question? I'm happy to answer it. There's no obligation. I just want that information out there. Uh, and I love to talk. Uh, by extension, I love to sort of like write about basically yammering on like this. So I really don't mind. So now I do have some uh, printed materials. There's about 20 of these, and there's a little more than 20 of you. If you want one of these, basically all the stuff here where you're going to see figures and sort of precise detail, it's all in these books as well. So if you didn't get it all down, just grab a book before anybody else does. Feel free to like push people out of the way, <laughs> uh, and and you'll have be able to just take it home with you um, because uh, you know I don't want people to be stressed out even by taking notes while I'm doing this. Just less stress in the world is my goal. Um, okay, so how many people are working in, in a freelance capacity? Yeah, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right, so working freelance compared to having a job job, it's basically like being a driver compared with being a passenger. When you're the driver, you don't get to take naps. You get to control what's on the radio, <laughs> which, you know, I, I guess the equivalent is like you don't have to use an alarm clock, which I'm cool with. Uh, but you have to be aware of lots of things that people with job jobs really don't have to be. The first of them being setting aside money for tax. When you have a job job, uh, one of the things they do is they withhold the tax for you. Now, when you do an actual tax return, what you're really doing is calculating your profit from all your various sources, your profit now, so what you've walked away with, and calculating your tax bill for the year. So then, they look at all the people who've been withholding tax from you and they subtract that from the tax that you actually owe. So if you, when you calculate it out, oh, you have a tax bill of 3,000, but your employer's withheld 2,000, you now have to make up the difference and pay them the 1,000. If you owe 3,000 and your employer's withheld 4,000, you get the difference back. So what a tax return really does is correct the figures and you pay the difference or get it back depending on how things are balanced out. The more freelance work you do compared to more, you know, like um, employment, because a lot of people do both, have a job and freelance, so the job will be withholding tax, but the freelance you're on your own, and that will tend to leave you a little bit short. So the question is, well, how much money should you be just taking out of your own hands uh, as you're working? Now, there is no really obvious answer to this question, and the reason is, we get taxed on our profit. So you bill, money comes in, and then you spend money to do the project, and whatever, you, whatever your profit was, whatever you walked away with, is what you get taxed on. So 
because ex some expenses are really easy to, to uh, attach to a project, but some expenses are like, what, what is the cost of heating your home office? What is the cost of the interest on the part of your mortgage that pertains to your office? How much did your car amortize over the year? Like, these are questions that you really don't have a daily answer for. So what you have to do, the best you can do, is do an estimate as the money is coming in of what you're gonna just sock away. Now, most of my clients, when all is said and done, end up, end up owing about 15 to 20% of their gross back in taxes, right? And the reason there's a range is because people spend more or less money on their businesses, right? And they have a bigger or lower profit margin. So you wanna sock away some number in between here, and then at the end of the year when you really do your taxes, you're gonna see how close you came. And then you're, when you do that for a few years, you kind of get a feel for how your business works, how you spend money, how you bill, and by that, how much you tend to get taxed. Now, one warning here, writers and editors have very low business expenses compared to people with other jobs, right? Which means that every dollar you, you actually get paid, you keep more of it than most people, which means you get taxed more than most people. So in this range of 15 to 20, writers and editors tend to, tend to skew toward the 20 because you just start keeping more of your money, right? You just have a very inexpensive job. So I would say if you have no idea how much money to save, every time you invoice somebody, every time they pay you, you take 20% and put it somewhere. I don't care if it's an ING, now tangerine. I don't care if it's in a bank account. I don't care if it's your mattress. I don't care if it's a can. It's all fine. Just somewhere where you won't touch it because you just, you just don't want to pretend that it's yours. You know, don't, like, don't get married to that money because it is not yours. And generally, if you sock away 20% or even go crazy and do 25, it is almost impossible for your tax bill to come to more than 25% of your gross. So if you absolutely want to know that when you file your taxes, you will have more than enough money to cover it, 25. If you want to probably have enough money to cover it, solid, 20. If you can't do it, do 15, and the bill at the end of the year that's exceeding what you've saved will probably be very small, smallish. Not enough to ruin your life and your future and the futures of your children. So try, try to keep, try to set aside about 20. I mean, as writers and editors, set aside the 20, it's, it's, a, safe, it's a safe bet. I find that, you know, um, generally, you know, your lives as freelancers are full of horrible surprises enough already without income tax being one of them. So just make it all good surprises with the taxes. Set the money aside. I had a client actually come to me one day and she like we did her taxes. It was her second year with me. And and, and she made good money, right? Like it was a good year, which is like tax day is backwards day when you, know, you make a lot of money and you go, oh no. You know, <laughs> the opposite's like, I made no money and I got really sick. I'm like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> but she did really well, right? And so the tax bill was like serious, right? Because she made it all freelance and I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa, you owe six thousand nine hundred dollars She said, that's okay, I got seventy two hundred bucks set aside. I'm like, whoa, Jets, whoa. And she said, you told me to. <laughs> and I went, and you did it? <laughs> that's what I tell them to do. <laughs> ah, she's one of my favorites. Um, yeah, so now, so these are estimates, but everybody does ha tend to have a way of running their business. You end up with your regular clients, you know, that pay you a regular amount and it costs you a regular amount to, to run your business. After a couple of years, you can actually just do a quick calculation, see how much you tend to owe, and figure that out as a percentage of what you tend to bill, and, and you will be able to estimate really, really well for your business. But for the meantime, these are good guidelines. Where do you put it? In a can, in a, uh, okay. Keep it out of your own hands, okay? We cannot be, I can't be trusted with ice cream, <laughs> and we can't be trusted with money. So just put it somewhere where it's a little harder to get at. ING, you can see that this slide was made like more than two years ago because it's not <laughs> ING anymore. I like ING though because it's just, the money's still there, but it's just sort of awkward to get to it. It's still there, you can get to it if you really want it. And that's sort of enough time to, you know, say just put the spoon back, Sonny, and leave that <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> um, now the other way to do it, if you only have one bank account, you don't want to like, like make a separate bank account, is to pay yourself a salary, which is basically the same thing that you have an account where all the money goes 
and then you just sort of pay out yourself on a cash or move it over or whatever. And then whatever stays in the account stays out of your own hands. This is just another way to keep yourself from spending money that is later going to be requested by the government. Um, how many people here are registered with the HSD? <coughs> okay. How many people aren't? Uh, how many people are, are worried about that? A little bit? Okay. Um, so what is the rule? How much do you have to make before you have to register? <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> I'll give you. I'll give you something to answer. <laughs> Thirty thousand, right? Thirty thousand in any twelve-month period, okay? Any twelve-month period. So if you get a thirty-thousand-dollar book deal, it, it happens, right? But it, but they pay you part in one calendar year and part in the other calendar year. Doesn't matter. It's the whole twelve-month period. Thirty thousand, you must register. Now it is super easy to register. You call them, you say it's time to register, they ask you what you do and how much you make, and they give you a number and you're done. Um, the pitfall here is, is not keeping track of that point in time when you're supposed to register. Uh, because nobody will remind you, you will never get a notice saying, by the way, it's now time for you to register. But what you might do is get a notice saying, hey, we just noticed you should have registered three years ago. Give us all the money you were supposed to be collecting. And that actually happens. You know, every time I have somebody new in the, in the office, they're always worried about like, what's a red flag, what's gonna get me audited. It is actually kind of tough to get audited unless they've decided to target your industry, which does happen sometimes. Uh, or if you have losses for many, many years, that happens too. But generally, particular expenses don't tend to trigger it. This, this thing that people do not worry about is exactly when to register. That happens all the time. I get a lot of new clients when that happens. So don't let it happen to you. And the key here is, if you've already waited too long, don't worry, just register. Because the weird thing is that if they find out that you should have registered in 2012, but because like, like last May, they were checking the 2012 returns. So people were getting phone calls about 2012, right? But if you registered a day before they got to your phone number, they'll leave you alone. They're telling other people, you owe back to 2012 retroactive, but as long as you register before they manage to contact you about it, even though you're late, it's cool. So if you cross that $30,000 line, if you're a little bit concerned about it, just register right now. Just register. <laughs> okay, cool. Because they're only checking 2013, like this year, right? I see a question, yes. Um, so that $30,000, I'm in a situation where I work as a medical writer full time and I kind of tripped on the small business on the side. Yeah. But that thirty thousand That's what I thought this was gonna be. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that thirty thousand is only attributed to only the, the freelance really distinct income. from your employment and Correct. From your employer. Correct. Thank you. Yep. So so the, the question again is if you have a job job and freelance income, what counts toward the thirty thousand? Only the freelance income counts. Because when you get the 30000 the government sort of feels like you're a going concern now and there should be some taxes happening. Now, one thing to note about this, too, is that you must register once you hit 30000 but you can register before. Now, why would you want to do that? Government tender. Okay, don't know what that means. What, because they want you to before, before you can work for them? Uh, I apply for government tender. And they, and they want you to have GST now. Even if you're yeah, it's a business number. They just want to be able to track you because you're not a corporation. If you were a corporation, they wouldn't really care. They, they, they'll take corporation or GST registration. Yes, but you can volunteer. You can choose to register just because you want to register. And there are two reasons to do this. One thing, and I can show this in the office. It's a bit of a complicated thing to show here. But in terms of money in your pocket, when you register for the HST, you always, and I mean always, end up ahead. Just a little bit but ahead. Okay, so there's that. I mean, in exchange for that, there's this extra issue of having to charge it and having to track it and having to remit it and having to file a thing that says, okay, here's how I calculated what I owe you guys. So it's a pain in the butt, and that little sh extra cash may just barely be make it worth your time, really. But the other reason is that almost every business owner in Canada knows the $30,000 rule. Right? Everybody put their hand up for that. Which means that if you bill somebody and you don't put your HST number on that, they know something about you. You are a very little fish. right? Which is cool if you're working in a, in a field that is full of little fish and it's not going to act against you. But if you're trying to, you know, like, like sort of throw your weight around a little bit and seem a little more like, like you could charge a little more because, hey, <laughs> you're a busy, busy, busy person with clients all 
all over the place. They're not going to believe you if you don't have an HST number because they know something. They know you don't make thirty. So you know, if you if you just if you just feel like you're going to get your your business, your corporate or whatever uh, image is going to suffer for that, think about registering. Um, uh, or if you just like your privacy, right? You just don't want them to know anything about you. Register because then they don't know. Um, so the way HST works in general is actually a very simple system. You bill it on top of your income and you give that to the government. When you spend money on your business, any HST that you spend, you get back from the government. That's it. Bottom line, uh, underneath it all, that's all it is. And the way that they do that is the way that you actually, this, the mechanism is that you file a return that says here, I collected $1,000 in HST, I spent $300 on my business, so here's 700 bucks. That's it. That is fundamentally it for the HST. And the reason that it saves you money is because you, if you're not registered, you don't get back the $300 in your HST. You just expense it. You just paid it, and it's gone. Now you get it back. Yes? Yeah, um, I was just wondering, if you have a client that's in the U.S., do you charge them the HST? Or? No. Okay, that's what the HST, <laughs> the bottom line rule with the HST is you charge it according to the buyer's location. If the buyer is in Calgary, you charge them 5% GST. If the buyer is in Ontario, you charge them 13% GHST. If the buyer is in the States, you charge them 0% HST. And when you're determining like your income, would you do it based on the Canadian conversion of how much you made from the American clients? Generally. I mean, and, and I mean, technically, you should be doing like the conversion based on what the dollar was worth on the day that you received it. I just, I tend to take the Bank of Canada average for the year and just apply it to everything. Okay. And, and depending on how big your volume is, whether that's really going to be an appreciable difference, you know, probably not. So that's how I would do it. And if you're close, just register. Oh, I've already registered. Oh, well. <laughs> All right then. All right, it's, it's HST theory. <laughs> it's theoretical. Um, I have an eight-page primer on this. Eight pages. It is more than enough information for any business you guys are running. Uh, it's more than enough information for anything any of my clients are doing. The actual HST guide from the government includes a lot of information on stuff like shipping massive amounts from countries. Uh, like they have to include everything, and most of it doesn't apply to you. This eight pages is everything, everything you need to know. Uh, email me, I'm sure there's some contact information or take the book and, and you can email me there and just ask for it and I'll email it to you. And really, you read that eight pages, you know more about the HST than 95% of Canadians. Um, and you like reading, right? <laughs> I wrote it, so don't come back to me and edit it and tell me that there's like semicolons where there shouldn't be. I, this is not my job writing this stuff. I'm a tax preparer. Obviously, obviously I'm an accountant. Um, right, 30, 30, you're responsible for knowing, getting caught years later. I always say the same things. Okay, <laughs> filing on time. So, let's say that you have run the numbers or a draft of your numbers and you know you were going to owe taxes here and you didn't set aside the 20% and you are in trouble and it's bad. Um, that's bad, but do not delay filing your tax return because of that. Never delay filing the paperwork. Because if you can't pay, it, you know, the, the government will uh, charge interest on your tax owing at a rate of 5% per year, which is, you know, it's interest, but it's not, it's not credit card interest. It's, it's not punitive. It's not, you know, uh, check cashing interest, you know, those payday loan places. Uh, it's not crazy. But if you are one day late with the return, they charge you 5% right there. If you are another month late, they charge another 1%. Every month is another 1% till you're a year late, and then they stop adding interest, but, but the penalty is now 17%, retroactive to when you should have filed, plus the interest, okay? So you save yourself a lot of money if you just get that return in before you know, the deadline, and even if you can't pay, they'll bill you, like everybody, they'll bill you. You'll sock them some money when you can. Sometimes they'll call and go, what's the plan here? Do you think you can do it in six months? And you'll say, sure. 
and then you know five and a half months later go yeah i couldn't do it and i'll go okay can you do it in like another six months like sure like just you can find a way to solve the money problem but not filing on time is a big pain in the butt now if you're already in that situation where you've fallen behind a year or more because once you fall behind it's it, it's like a train right it accelerates and all of a sudden you're you're five years behind before you sort of blink um if they have not asked for the return when they ask for the return, there's a letter called a demand letter where they want you to file a return. Until they send you that letter, you can file old returns under what's called the Voluntary Disclosure Program and they will forgive the penalty, okay? You, it's just like the, the registering for the HST before they ask. If you file it before they ask for it, you're good. Now, I do this for clients all the time and they, they say, okay, we've gotten your, you know, the, the Voluntary Disclosure Program Department has received your thing and we'll let you know what we decide. I have never seen them not go for it. As long as they have not sent you that letter, they always forgive the penalty. The interest is hard to get rid of because you're late. But the penalty for not filing, they're bureaucrats. They love paper. It makes them so happy. Make them happy. It's what they want. They want it more than they want money. That's how much they love paper. <laughs> uh, so just give it to them. And one nice thing, self-employed people and their spouses, any amount of self-employment income gets you six weeks of extra filing time, which a lot of accountants won't tell you because they want you to get you their stuff, right? Like just. And then they can get, they can go, oh, you're late, but all right, I'll let you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Accountants are sneaky people, is my point. Um, but everybody, you got an extra six weeks, and so do your spouses, common law partners, whatever. Extra six weeks, because you do have more work to do. I mean, you just do, that's business, right? Um, so uh, there. Um, the, the uh, just FYI, the tax bill is actually still due on April 30th. So if you do file on June 15th, you're, you're, you're filing on, on time, but the money is late. But at their rate of 5% per year, it's like a 1% interest rate. So most people just sort of take the six weeks and don't really care about the 1% because it's 1%. I mean, seriously. Um, just FYI. So, so you know, yeah, this is what I explained. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, if you've been late, if you get nailed with being late, and you're late more than once in a three-year period. CRA sees things in three-year periods. They sort of see three years as you have the current, your current trend is every three years. If you're late twice in three years, they double the penalties. Please file on time. Double the penalties. Okay. <laughs> keeping records. CRA, you are responsible for keeping your records seven years after you file a return or after the, the, the year to which the return pertains, whichever comes later, which bottom line tends to, even if you're filing an old return now, you have to hold your stuff for seven years after now, okay? So it, it might even be a good thing, like if you keep things in an accordion folder or something, you have to put a little label that says destroy after and you know, like add seven years and, you know, because it's hard to keep track of this stuff, but you, after seven years, they can't ask for anything, so dump it. And I've also been told that uh, legally, if you have kept something older, and what you've kept contradicts something that you filed, you can get in trouble. So destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> At seven years, just keep it for seven years, and then immediately, I, I think, find somebody with a wood-burning fireplace and have a party. <laughs> I mean, just before the toxic fumes take you over, it's got to feel so good, right? Um, <laughs> well, it's a lot of toner, so I'm saying. <laughs> um, Thermal receipts. So more and more receipts are being printed with like like it's that shinyish paper. There's no real ink on it. It's actually heated up. If you've ever held one of those in your like in your front pants pocket or whatever, you know that that they fade. And even if you keep them somewhere like away from your butt, um, they will <laughs> fade uh, after a few years. And certainly before the seven years is up. So. Those ones, you want to scan them or photocopy them or, or something, record them in some more permanent way because the thermal receipts are just going to, they're just going to die on you. So, um, yeah, yeah, receipts must include an, an address and date to be valid. Um, technically, that's, that's sort of the minimum requirement from CRA and what this, uh, like an odd sort of side note to this is, that an auditor who's looking at your receipts does not have to accept as proof a credit card bill, okay? 
take the, the, the register tape, they have to take that. The credit card bill, they don't. They can do it anyway. If they decide that you're probably okay and they're in a good mood or whatever, but they don't have to. They can say this doesn't really count. So the actual tape, you gotta keep it. Uh, sorry, but it's true. I say the same thing every time. Um, very boring. Um, a reasonable estimate. So, uh, you know, if you, let's say, if you know you did a four month contract that required you to do two interviews a week, uh, and you took the TTC every time with a token, but you didn't get a receipt for the tokens. You got a good record that you did the four month thing, you, you know, you can explain what it was, you can explain where you come up with this twice a week thing, and calculate it, just multiply by the cost of a token. They'll usually take that. I mean, what CRA really, really wants is some kind of record, some kind of, like, even if you just like a logbook, like, as long as you've written it down or you're making sense, they will often just accept that. Like, like when I say they don't have to accept the credit card receipt, but they sometimes will. Like, or if you have like, you know, you have your cell phone bill, but you're missing November, but it's like it's like eighty-seven dollars every month. Well, just put the other eighty-seven dollars on there. They'll take it. Like, they know that's just highly unlikely that you didn't spend eighty-seven dollars. You did every eighty-seven dollars from you know January to December except for November, and that was. You know, like they can be reasonable if you have a if you put in an estimate that is based on really solid reasoning, they'll usually take that. Um, car logs. How many people actually use their car in their business? Ah, Toronto crowds. <laughs> okay. So um, car logs. Technically, you have to keep a record of how many miles you put on the car for business, and an amount of how many miles you, kilometers you put on the car overall and then you take the whole cost of running the car including the insurance and the maintenance and the gas and everything and you multiply it by that uh, percentage so for example if you find that okay when you measured out all your kilometers that you basically use the car 10 percent was for business you find the cost of running the whole car for the whole year and take 10 percent of that that's your business expense now I've been told, again, this is very informal, but I've been told that they tend to sort of be okay with it if you claim anything under 25. If you really spend your car, use your car more than 25% for business, you must have the car log. Now, this is another one of those things where they have the right to demand it no matter how much you use the car. You say 2% car use and they still want the log. But in practice, I am told, they'll sort of take your word for it under 25 or 25, they want to see the log. And what the log does is, on this day I traveled from here to here, for business, like how did you get that figure of how many kilometers you put on for business? The car law records that. Now in the old days you have like a little book and you just sort of write the date and your start point, your end point, the kilometers that you know, your odometer reading before and after and, <clears throat> and that still works. And you'll notice by the way that that's something you can write down yourself, right? Like you're on your own recognizance on this thing, right? Where you just, you have the law and everything and they'll accept it just because it's so much writing. They love writing, they love, paper and they love writing and then like even though yeah I just wrote this out here and they're like all right it's paper <laughs> I, I don't understand but a lot of times I'll take it um, but now there are apps you know uh, you can get a million different apps for your phone that's like doing that by GPS and recording it and everything start and stop and, and that's even better because you know the map is in there already and it's like cool so um, if you're using the car less than 25 percent maybe you don't have to be quite as much of a stickler maybe you can just sort of like throw an estimate but if you're going to want to claim more than 25 percent do a log to cover your butt uh where there are thermal receipts losing the integrity as we speak um this is my basic rule this is kind of my rule for everything it's like exercise keeping records is like exercise an imperfect plan that you actually use you know that you actually do is better than a perfect plan that's sort of out there <laughs> right um, uh, for many years I really ran my business with a shoebox like I have a receipt eh, right and then once a year I'll go into the shoebox and store everything and you know and the cat loves receipt <laughs> everything is crinkly now I know I know just back off and puke somewhere else but and even now I use an accordion folder that's basically a glorified shoebox I'm running an entire business with a shoebox. There's nothing wrong with that. It's whatever is actually the, the thing that you will do consistently. Because it is better to just have a bunch of paper and find out that you don't need it all than to not have something that you really need. So if throwing things in the shoebox once a week, you empty out your wallet, you throw it into a shoebox, you sort it all out later, that's fine. I don't care. 
You know, I, I don't I, I don't need you to enter every every detail in a you know a spreadsheet with a database and cross reference. It doesn't matter as long as everything's in there. So um, you know, uh, be consistent. Um, EI for freelancers. This is fairly new. I mean, new. You know, this is like I knew. So it's like five years old or something. It's like my dad, you know, when he was in his 80s, he'd go, ah, the, the, that guy, he's a young guy. I'm like, how young? He's like 60. <laughs> <laughs> it's new. Um, so as freelancers, you cannot get EI as we normally think of EI. When we say EI, most people are thinking about the money that you get when you are out of work. From the government's point of view, when you are a freelancer, you are never out of work even if you're not working, because you're marketing and you're, you know, I don't know, building your website and your presence and all that stuff. And that is the, how you should look at your business anyway. But it means that it's, there's no good way to define when you need wage and replacement because you're out of work. And so they say, well, forget it. We don't just don't do that. But EI covers other things that people don't really realize are the same system, and that is maternity leave, parental leave, compassionate care leave, and sickness leave, okay? When you're too sick to work, when you're caring for somebody who is dying, when you are the parent of a new child, or when you are the mother of a new child. Those are all forms of EI, and you can qualify for them, except that unlike with a regular job, it's not automatic, where everybody pays in automatically. On your freelance income, the only way to get those forms of EI is you have to contact Service Canada and sign up for a specific agreement that says that you're gonna give them a certain percentage of your freelance income in order to be covered. And then if and when you have a child, if and when you have to care for somebody who's dying, if and when you're too sick to work, you will get the EI benefits outlined in that agreement. So the rule is, I think it's, I forget what the percentage is, uh, because this is not Revenue Canada, this is not tax, it's not issued by the Revenue Canada uh, people, so it's not my field, I just mention it because people wanna know. It's Service Canada, I don't know what the rule is, I think it's 1.74%, but I really don't know. And the rule is this, you must pay into it for one year before you can make any claim on it. You can back out at any time. You can decide, okay, I, I'm gonna stop paying premiums, I'm out, until you make a claim. As Soon as you make a claim, you're in for the rest of your life. Because the benefit that you're getting is based on the idea that you're gonna pay into it for your entire working life. So they can't afford to let you pay for one year, you know, your, your 2%, take your 75% mat leave, yes and then walk off, right? No, once you make a claim. So it is something to actually think about, right? This is not, this is not one of those things that's automatic, you know, what the answer is for everybody. You really have to think through, are you really ever gonna need it, considering what it can do for you and what it can't do for you, and are you prepared to sort of be in this agreement for your entire working life after making a single claim? Okay. You know, different answer for everybody. Service Canada is who you wanna to talk to, and they'll set that up with you. It is fairly new. I don't have a lot of clients who do it. Um, I was under the understanding at first when they first introduced this that it would actually be part of the tax return, like, like billing the, the actual EI premium would come as part of your taxes. But it is not, does not seem to have appeared on the tax return. I don't, at least I haven't seen it. So I really, this is the limit of my, this slide is everything I know about EI for freelancers. There it all is. So now you know as much as I do. Um, I don't know why somebody had asked me about that. Okay, so that is all the really key stuff I wanted to get across. It is we're open for questions, and I see one there. Um, on that last EI slide, you had something about um, for profit facilities insurance. What was that about? Um, yeah, well, if you don't want to go, like this is the government system, right, EI? Mm -hmm. But you can also just go to a private insurer mm -hmm. and you know get a, a plan that sort of works for you, right? That's the other option because there's nothing that. EI, the government's version of EI can do for you that a for-profit company couldn't do also. I would guess that if they're exactly, if, if the payout is exactly the same, that for-profit is gonna cost more because they have to make a profit, which the government doesn't have to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that's the answer there. Uh, yes, uh, Sean is it? <laughs> it's my friend. <laughs> I, uh for the NHS uh, do you have to renew it every few years? I forget. No. What, what you have once that's, that's once you're registered, you must file your returns and remit, of course, if you owe. Uh, every, whatever your filing period is, most people, it's like one year. Every year you must remit until you either cancel the HST number or to have it suspended or whatever. So 
once you're in it, you kind of have to report back to them on a regular basis as to what you're doing in terms of HST. There's obviously you're in till you die. <laughs> like, and if your sure income, that's good. Yeah, if your income <laughs> drops below the thirty thousand and you just don't want to be registered anymore, you can call them and they'll usually make you sort of finish out like the month or the quarter or whatever, and then suspend or or, or delete your number, and then you want to file anymore. Right? You can always get out of it, but until you suspend or delete your number, you got to just keep reporting back to them. And Does it make sense to do that, or should we just? Well, the thing, thing is, I'm I'm biased. I'm going to say no because, like, you always walk away with more money if you're good at partitioning money, like setting money aside and not really getting seduced by it. Um, there's no downside, really. You, okay. you, if you set aside every dollar you bill on a, an HST, the most you can ever remit is every dollar that you collected. Mm -hmm. And that's only if you didn't spend anything on your business. So it's easy to keep yourself safe. Whatever you bill in HST, put it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You will owe that or less, always less, to the government, and the rest is yours to keep and drink, I assume. Mm -hmm. You're right, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So and, and so if you're good at you know, you're good at socking money away and you you kinda of don't mind doing this little calculation and you're good at tracking things, then there's no downside to having the HST. The HST only has a downside if, if numbers give you give you like a feel like a like a spear like like through your eyeball. If that's how numbers make you feel, then maybe you should suspend it. But you don't have to. Okay, I've been wondering about that because I registered a few years ago and I was freelancing full time, but mm -hmm. since then I've gotten a full time job, so I only do a little bit of freelancing right. outside, but I still have my HST. Yeah, you can call them at any time and they'll say, okay, uh, we'll cancel you as of this date. We need a stub return. So they need a return that covers from the last time you told them what you were doing right. to the, the date that they close yeah, so it off and that goes to like how we would stop once you, you call them. Call the phone number is in the little booklet. Um, uh, it really is very easy to do stuff over the phone. And then they may actually ask for a form now. Some some stuff with the HST that you used to GST whatever that you used to do just by the phone. They now like want some paper again. Bureaucrats. Paper makes them. It's what they line their nests with. They like it. <laughs> Warm. Um, <laughs> They're cats. They're all cats. Um, any <laughs> any other questions? Yes. Yes, um, you said that uh, receipts must include address and date to be valid. Technically, yeah. No, um, does this, so what counts as the address and date? Does this, like, could I, because sometimes I'm going yeah. to a little corner store. Yeah, and I mean, that's the weird here. thing. You could just write it down, like, you write it down. You're like, okay. and it's just like, as long as you got a record of it, okay. A thing I want to mention, actually, this is a good point here uh, that I want to mention. Meals and entertainment. Okay, now meals and entertainment, this is a, a special kind of deduction. You only get to deduct 50% of it. Uh, now, what it's meant to cover is schmoozing. Okay, schmoozing or business meetings that include food or whatever. If you're a food writer and you have to pay for the meal in order to write about it, that is not schmoozing. That's just an expense. But meals and entertainment generally are business meetings. There's two, two kinds. There's a kind where you're eating with somebody and therefore it's a meeting. And there's a kind where your work has taken you out of your region for 12 hours or more. And so you have to buy lunch or something. And both of those will count as meals and entertainment. Same as if you go to a conference or something. Uh, any meals that you buy while you're on a conference because you're out of town, you know, if the conference is related to your work, that also goes into meals and entertainment. Um, but it's a number that the government loves to review because it's so easy to fudge. So if they've decided to review you, and if you've got anything in meals and entertainment over like 50 bucks, they're going to say, oh, that's an interesting number. Can we see those receipts? Now you may have the receipts, but then they'll say, well, this one. In what way was this a business meeting? Right? And they could be asking you about something that's seven years old, or more likely one or three years old. Right? You've got to have an answer for them. Because if you don't have an answer for them, they don't have to accept your word that this was a business meeting. And because meals and entertainment are one, it's one thing that they just love to review, always, before you throw it in the shoebox, write down who you met with. Just write down who you met with. And if all it says is, lunch with Lisa R., and you go, oh yeah, we did a series of talks together. We were having a meeting about that. They can't argue with you. Just because you wrote somebody's name on this thing. 
So it's such an easy thing to do, and it's easy to do when it's fresh in your mind. So write it down, almost write it down. If you can, write it down at the table with the dim sum, like dripping on it, just write it down before you put it anywhere, just to cover your butt, because that is one that they do like to review. You know, There's a lot of handwritten stuff that they'll just accept, and that's one of them. Now, I'll be honest here, when I have things from the corner store, I just throw them in. But like, I'm like, if you really want to disallow this $2.38 receipt, you go ahead and you find them all. I'm taking a nap. You know, like, like I kind of will let it go for something that's small. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes? You're deducting for a home office, mm -hmm. and you say you're using 25% of the space for sure. your home or your condo for office. Mm -hmm. What about electricity? Do you only charge, can you only deduct 25% of that? That is exactly you know? how it works, is it's just like the car, okay? First of all, the percentage that you use can be based on either floor space or on number of rooms. So you've got four rooms and one of them is your office, that's 25%. Or you've got, you know, 1,000 square feet, 250 is your office, 25%. You take the whole cost of having that space, which if you're renting, is rent and utilities. And if you own, is mortgage interest, but not the principal, uh, property taxes and utilities. You take that whole number and you multiply it by 25%, and that's what you get to write off. Okay, two hands. I'm going to start there and then come back here. Okay, yes. Um, just about the voice matching. <laughs> yeah. Does your pages talk about when you have to charge your expenses to your client? The thing is that if you charge your expenses to your client, you get reimbursed, so you can't expense them because you didn't end up spending the money. The only way that you can expense something is if you locked, like spent the money and right. never got it back. But when you when you give them the bill, you yeah. charge them with that agency so you can spend it as the agency. You know what? It doesn't even matter. Like, like it technically, you wise. don't have to. Well, then it shouldn't because they get every HST they spend, they get it back. If they decided that it matters, then do it the way they like it. But it really doesn't matter. So just what about on the meals and entertainment since it's you only get half back? And still yeah, you get back half. You get back half the HST. Right. Right. And it, it's. It's like terrible. they get whatever they have the value out of tax where so you get to say here's the bill. Yeah, yeah. It's like do it however they want it, you know. In the end, like mathematics, the government I don't think really cares. You know. Anyway. Um so there are two questions over here. I'll start there and I come in and this way. Oh, hi. I wanted to um sorry, uh, briefly mention about the different ways of doing the HST. A lot of people are not familiar with the quick method. The quick method, which most writers should be on. Okay, so the 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 system that I was telling you about is the true HST. You collect it, you remit it. You spend it, you get it back. Simple. But because people don't even like doing that much math, there is a quick method. And the quick method is, I made this much money and I charge HST and the government says give us 8.8% of that on a service if you're an Ontario-based company. Um, where they just take a flat rate off the top and you keep the rest and call it your gross income and you calculate your taxes or other. So it's quick. I don't like it because it's sort of non-scientific. And uh, <laughs> you make more money. You, you do. More. You do yeah. only if and only because you're writers. Yes. Because the percentage that they have calculated as being like that percentage is based on well, what's the average amount that people spend to make a dollar freelance? And like I said, writers spend less than that. So they're, saying, they're assuming, okay, you, for every $13 in HST that you, you collected, you probably spent $3.20 on, but for writers that's not true. You probably spent a buck, right? So you actually get to hold more money. So if your main freelance business is writing, when you register for the HST, ask for the, to be on the quick method. They'll ask you a couple of questions. There are some uh, professions that won't let you. I can't. Tax preparers are exempt from, we are like not exempt or not allowed forbidden uh, to use the quick method, but writers can and, and should. And I'm saying that, yes, you should, even while I hate it, because it's not scientific and it messes up the spreadsheets. And actually, on the first 30,000, you get to save an extra one. Well, yeah, but that's true, first. but that is reasonable, too, because yes. the, the first, like, there's a certain economies of scale yes. thing going yes. on there. But either way, writers, writers almost never actually, like, writers are almost always ahead. 
Yeah. Unless they are like travel writers, right? Where a huge amount of the money goes back out if they're not going on junkets or whatever. I mean, yeah, that's generally true. The quick method is generally better for you. Um, when you actually look at it, the, the quick method actually is remarkably accurate. Like when I have run both sets of numbers, if you're not a writer or if you're an expensive writer, it, for everybody else, it actually falls within like 40 bucks. It's not bad. But for writers, it can save you a lot of money. So yeah, ask for the quick method for sure. Yeah, okay, yes. So you were mentioning how you can deduct a certain percentage of your house in proportion to the space needed for the business. Right. Fine. If your business represents a portion of your work hours, then you have to fraction that as well. What so we're talking, you, what we're talking about is dedicated space. The space that you run up generally for your home office has to be dedicated to your business and does not become personal space after hours. If it does, you have to prorate it by the hour. Well, that's exactly it, because for myself, I'm doing full-time hours, and probably about five to ten hours a week for this small. Doesn't place. matter if the little place where you have your computer and your bookshelf and everything doesn't get used for anything else. Doesn't matter that it's only ten hours. But if it does get used for something else, if you say, well, when I'm working freelance, I use it for my office, the rest of the time, I use it to watch movies, <laughs> then you've got to prorate it. But if it's an office, even if the office is only, you're like, look, I rent an office, right? Okay. I don't use it 24 hours a day. I don't even use it 12 months of the year, and I still have to pay the full rent. So, oh, oh I don't have to, wow. Well, <laughs> okay. right? No, like, because, because that's the way office space works, right? You pay the rent whether you're there or not. The only thing is, as long as you don't use it for your personal life after hours, or if you use it for less than 10% of your personal life after hours, if that is really gets largely ignored for everything else. And that's fine, because you can't use it for your life. You've, you've blocked it off for your business. It's not available to your personal life anymore. It's full of your stuff that's business stuff. It's not fun anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even though you don't have that much work to do there, even so, you've still dedicated it. You know, so you still get to, you know, you still get to, to write it off like by, by floor space. The only thing is, if it changes use, you know, in the hours that you're not working. And I know the problem with it now is, the problem with business use of home in the modern age, really, is that people have laptops. And they tend to work wherever they are. Yeah. So, and, and the tax law, as usual, has not kept up with reality. So when I say it's like, pretend. Pretend it's parked somewhere and just give me an estimate of how much space it's all taken up, you know? You know, because it's the best you can do. Just pretend. Okay. Yes? The second question would be, uh, the small business that I'm participating in, many people do as a small business. Mm -hmm. So if you're a distributor for a product and you're having to charge HST because you're choosing to participate, and so many other people are not because they're not hitting that $30,000 threshold, does it become a competitive disadvantage on businesses that are operating on a small scale? When you, are, when you are selling your product to not another business, but to an individual. Yes. Yeah, because you're out. Like, you, you either take the hit you know, just sort of charging $100 but having to remit part of that to the government anyway, or charging $100 plus the 13% HST, and you don't take the hit, but you might not get the sale. That's exactly Yeah, and that is, that is unfortunately the downfall. Yep. Can I do it as me taking the hit and... Of course, you can, you can do whatever you need. Like, if you want to be, if you personally want to remit HST, the government doesn't care where you got the money. They don't okay, care if so you have it doesn't to, have to be on the receipts dedicated. Well, it's it is, it only matters for if you're selling to a business because the reason that it has to be split out is because they are claiming it back. Right? So technically, yeah, it's supposed to be split out. But for when you're selling to an individual, it has no mathematical impact. When you're selling to a company, it does. Now, if you do want to split it out, what you do is let's say I'm gonna take an easy example and just say that the product costs 100 bucks, right? And you don't want to charge 113. So you charge them 100 you charge them 87 plus HST. Yeah. Or it's not quite 87, it's actually a little bit more than that. You can split it out anyway, but the, they don't care if you're splitting it out if the number is still 100 bucks. Right. right. So go ahead and split it out or don't split it out. It really doesn't matter. Okay. It matters when you're selling to a magazine. It matters when you're selling to any kind of entity that might be claiming it back. They're the only ones who really have to care okay. whether you split it out. So. I'll go here now. <laughs> Um, going back to the question about the quick method mm -hmm. and when to register for it, at what point can you opt in to do the quick method before you file your taxes? 
And you can, okay, you have to ask for the quick method either when you sign up or ask to change. Whatever method you're on, they make you keep it for at least one year. If you switch, you've got to stay in the new method for at least one year. It's just to keep you from like bouncing back and forth. You can, and it used to be that you could just, again, call them up and ask them to change it. Uh, in the last couple of years, they've asked for you to fill out a form, which is basically a really simple form that says, I want to change, and I want it, because I want it. It's, it's not that complicated <laughs> form, really. I think they just like the paper, right? Because the guests are getting cold, and they just want something else to, you know. Um, so yeah, you just call them and ask them and see what their rule is. Sometimes if, you're, if you've been on one method for a while, and you're five and a quarter, they might let you do it after, after the end of a quarter. But generally, you have to, whatever system you're on, you have to be on it for at least a year. And then the government will tell you sort of when their next break point is where they'll let you change over. Right? Okay. Anybody over here? All right. Come back to you and then you. Okay. Okay. Um, in terms of courses uh, and conferences and memberships to professional organizations, mm -hmm. uh, are all of those allowed under expenses or do I have to apportion according to? How much is used actually? Um, there, are, I mean, there are a lot of them. If the there, there is a whole section called business taxes, fees, and memberships. Mm -hmm. So obviously, memberships to like EAC uh, would 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 qualify. One thing you did mention was conferences. Um, I don't know if the actual figure has changed, but there is a limit to how much you can spend on conferences. Mm -hmm. it used to be two thousand. It might still be two thousand because they haven't changed it yet. But keep an eye on that because there is sort of a maximum for that. But generally, yeah, if you're a member of an organization. Uh, you, that's related to what you do and helping you get work. Yeah, it doesn't matter how much of it you, you know, use. What is the situation you're, that you're thinking of specifically, just so I make sure um, I understand? Okay, um, actually it's membership to um, a professional organization that I thought I would be getting work in that area. I uh, have not had work in it for the past year. Okay. So someone from CRA could say, what's the no. problem? Okay, number one, you're fine. Number two, you lead me into a very interesting concept or a very important concept. The reasonable expectation of profit. Now when you have an expense that CRA is questioning and you have proof that you spent it, right? So they're not arguing that you spent it. They're arguing whether or not it's a business expense or whether or not you get to deduct it. This is their sole criteria. Is it, did you have a reasonable expectation of profit? Profit, and all three of those words is key. Profit, in other words, did you have a reasonable expectation that if you spent 50 bucks on the membership that you were gonna make more than 50 bucks back? Profit. Expectation, meaning it doesn't have to actually happen that way. You just have to have expected it to happen. And reasonable, right or wrong, were you reasonable to think that that was gonna pan, pan out for you? You know, like if you, if you are a, like a, a writer about parrots, and you join the American Parrot Association hoping it might lead to something and it doesn't. Look, you're a writer about parrots, right? It makes total sense that you would, you know, try to use the association to, you know, work, work your magic and get a gig, right? It's reasonable. You had an expectation of profit. It didn't pan out. You still had a reasonable expectation of profit. So yes, I would say absolutely. The gentleman behind you and then... Oh, you know? yes. um, from HST Mm -hmm. Do they require the receipts? It's just like, no, when let, anything you file, you file your income tax return and your HST return, you don't send in anything. You just keep it. There's a bunch of things like this where they just do your calculations. Because the, the thing that people forget about the tax system, it is 99.9% .9 honor system. Like, an audit is a spot check. Because most of the time they just take your word for it. They don't want your paper. You know? They want to be able to see it, right? They want you to fill out their forms and tell them, okay? But they don't want to see your cash register receipts until they've decided to look at you. So keep it all. You're going to have to keep it anyway. It's all the same paper that you're keeping for your business anyway. Then keep it, but you never send anything in. You just sort of go, here's my math. And generally, they just sort of take it. This, this lady and then this gentleman here. Um, I just, uh, about conferences, because it sounded like, where do they fall? Because I think you said uh, meals and entertainment, but then also, like, for like, the EAC conference is very much professional development right. courses. Right, and I would put that under other, because there's no specific place for conferences. Okay. But the meals that you have, if it's oh, held sorry. outside of, of Toronto, the meals oh, are under meals oh, and entertainment. Okay. Yeah, even though they're not shoes and meals. Those are just because you're traveling. Any travel out of your region, any travel you do for your business 
if you eat at a restaurant when you're traveling, I see. you get that's meals and entertainment. Thank this gentleman here. Um, how much um, should a uh, freelancer reasonably expect to pay an accountant to prepare a, a tax return? I mean, obviously, it depends on the time your accountant is going to need. Right. But uh, on average, I that is an almost impossible question to answer because I'll tell you. First of all, uh, just so you know, I, I tend to charge a flat rate. Um, pretty much all my clients are paying pretty much the same amount. Uh, I have little little tweaky bits, but generally I have a flat rate. I can't say. You know, when I started in this business, I was so inexpensive, and I am not inexpensive anymore. <laughs> right? Nor should I be because I've been doing this for over 10 years and I know things and I will spot things because I'm experienced. Mm -hmm. So it is impossible to say. Now, just so you do know, and this, take it as biased as you want, you do not need a chartered accountant to do income taxes. You really, really don't. Now I have an accounting, I have a, some accounting background, but mostly I do income taxes. And most of the time I know more about personal income taxes than a CA who does not specialize. And the thing about CAs is that they will charge a, what we call in the industry, ton. It's a metric ton. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason actually is partly because they are, they are, their skills are so valued that they have to charge you something that will make up for the fact that while they're working on you, they can't work on some corporate something or other. And the other reason is that personal income taxes is the second lowest paying uh, uh, field of accounting. The second lowest. The so lowest? lowest. <laughs> Bookkeeping. Why? I think, because mostly women do it. Okay, I'm done. I said it. <laughs> it's out there. Um, <laughs> It's also true of any. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, there you go. I mean, how much do you charge? Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. They, you have to talk. Okay. <laughs> I, am, I, I used to be sort of, I used to be, well, obviously when I started out at the bottom, I used to be sort of in the low part of the middle. I'm aiming for the high middle now because honestly, um, I'm better because I've been doing it so long. So I'm not the cheapest. Um, I am very good, but I'm not the cheapest anymore. You said flat rate. What is your flat rate? <laughs> I, haven't said, I haven't even said it yet. Just email me and I'll let you know. I will say that if you say that you're in the Editors Association, I give a 10% discount on, on my tax preparation services in general because I like editors and writers, um, you know, because I do. And my, and my rate does include doing the HST. But there are some things I charge on top of. It depends on sort of your, your picture. But generally, uh, you will know ahead of time what you're going to pay. It's very rare, very rare that what I tell you you're going to pay is different from what you actually pay, right? I do charge HST, make over 30000 so. Yes, um, Sean, right? Uh, I question the HST, uh, and I watched it. How can you not know this stuff, Sean? Well, I know, because I, I just give it to you. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay. The HST, you need to pay it annually or quarterly, right. and I've gotten dinged on that. Because I, I want, I pay it or file it, these are two different things as in all tax stuff. If you, when you register, you have the option of setting up a filing. Now, filing is giving the government an accounting of what you owe them. It is separate from paying, although most people do it in sort of one envelope. But they are separate things. You have the right to report to them every three months or once a year. Your choice. You also have the, the option to pay them every quarter what you think you owe. Uh, or pay them once a year, or pay them once every five years. You can do whatever you want. They're just going to charge you interest. However, if you owe more than three thousand dollars of tax, and that's income tax or HST, then they want you to start paying quarterly because they're losing that interest and they want the interest. So they, if you don't pay the quarterly installments and they want them, they'll ask you for them. They'll say, "Here's a quarter. Here's a quarter of what you owed last year. Can, you, can we have it, please?" Right? If you don't pay that. You're fine, but if at the end of the year when you finally do decide to pay it off, you owe more than three thousand, they'll go, "Yeah, see, you should have paid that installment. We want the interest on that installment and the interest on this installment." Now, personally, and I'll, again, honestly, my business has a huge. All the income comes in this one period, and I pay my whole income tax and my whole HST in one shot. But I'm supposed to pay quarterly. So what they do is go, "Okay, here's what you owe. We've split it into quarters." We've applied, you know, 
eight months of interest on the first quarter and five, you know, six months of interest on the next quarter. And they'll just apply the interest and I just pay it. Because to me, that's just easier. People who don't like to know, like, don't like the idea that a bill could be adding up in the background and we don't really see it, like to remit their money more, more regularly. And it certainly keeps it out of your hands. And if you overpay, you get a refund anyway. Okay, so it really is a matter of, do you like to keep the control of your money for the whole year, but then sort of like, let it be a bit of a surprise what you owe? Or do you want to get that money out the door, kind of know what you owe, get it out the door every three months, but it means you have to run the calculations four times a year. Now me, I'm the kind of person where if I had a big enough washing machine, I would take all the clothes for an entire month and throw it in one. I would just like live on, like I would just, I would just go until there was nothing left and then do it all at once, because that's, that's me. So I don't, I don't like to do things quarterly, because I'm just too damn lazy. But some people can't stand the uncertainty. So they do it quarterly. Now, are they, I mean, did you file to, like, I usually tell people to go annual, please go annual, filing annual, you're filing annually, right? You file. I, I think uh, when I first did, I wasn't paying attention, I, I was quarterly, and I had to get you to fix that, to change over the yeah. annual. It's a pain in the butt. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Annually, yeah. yeah. oh, you wouldn't have, you, you wouldn't define me, would you? <laughs> no, so, yeah, it's annual now. Um, I, I'll do it for. I mean, I'll do. I'll do the, the calculations for people either way. But the thing is, that the advantage to me when you guys do it annually is that if you do it quarterly, it's due at the end of the quarter plus a couple weeks. But if you file, so like every quarter you're supposed to be sending stuff in, and if you have to come in and have me do it, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. Or you do it yourself, and I have to fix something at the end always. But if you file once a year, it's due the same time as your tax return, June fifteenth. And I use the same figures to calculate both things. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's easier. Just bring me everything. I do everything at once. I file your income tax return, and I get you your HST numbers at the same time. So if you're filing annually, it kind of works nicely. But if they want the installment payments, either you pay them when they say they want them to try to get within the $3,000 bullseye, or you just wait, pay at the end, and take your lumps, which frankly is what I do. You know, there's, no, there's no law against that. It's just I pay it. I pay uh, an interest fee for them. Anyway, anything else? Yes. Yeah, two questions. Sorry. Okay. If you have business income as well as employment income, mm -hmm. can you choose your annual reporting cycle to be synchronous and have your business uh, declared for just at December? Uh, because then you can kind of see your whole year picture, and I may only have half a year picture from the other part. I know that if you're incorporated, if you're incorporated, you definitely can because you can match your HST to your, to your uh, fiscal year end. Okay. But I know that on the income tax side, you used to be able to choose your fiscal year end for your, per, for your business, and you can't anymore. Like now they want the calendar year because it just makes their lives easier. So that's so, perfect though, because the calendar year end is for your taxation is December. Yeah, if you, if you, you know, like, I mean, technically my cycle should end at the end of June. Right, because that's when I finish making all my money. Make no more money until the next year. Right, so that would be a good time for my fiscal year to end. But I'm a personal business. I'm not an incorporation, so I have to take the calendar year, which isn't really the best. Okay, but they'll so they'll so match. Good. Generally, generally, everybody, most people take the calendar year. And for your income taxes, if you're starting a business now, you definitely have to take the calendar year for your income taxes. I don't know if you can shift your HST if you wanted to, to make it match your the, the, the seasons of your. Um, and the second question I have is, is it reasonable expectation of profit or is it reasonable expectation of net profit? So I'm a medical writer, I'm a scientist, I go to nutraceutical seminars, I'm involved because it's brain fun. I tri I'm tripping on money, I happen to get paid for it. Um, so, but I- Like the Grateful Dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just like, uh, I'm not necessarily certain that there'll necessarily be a net profit from right. the process. Right. So I just don't know if, like, if it's going to take me time because I'm expecting the business to ramp up very slowly as a part-time thing. How do you gauge whether... You know, it is a gray area because reasonable means different things to different, different people. Profit has a really clear definition and expectation has a clear definition. But reasonable doesn't. But here's yeah, there could be there could be income. There, there could be taxes, income. But, but here's not. here's the thing: when you're doing your in income taxes, you have to separate your personal feelings from okay. the money. And what the 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 Gedanken experiment 
okay, uh, that I like to run people through is pretend you have a twin. She likes exactly what you like. She does exactly what you do. And she says, give me the money to go to this conference. I think it's going to make me money. If it does, I will pay you back. And if it doesn't, well, you're just out the cash. Would you lend it to her? If you can make the case that that's a good gamble, there you go, because that's all an auditor can ask of you. And if you can't make that case, well, shouldn't you be able to make that case? Well, for me, it's kind of accidentally easy to make the case because it's happening anyway. If it's a reason, yeah. The thing is that if you do make a profit, then the question of whether you were reasonable to expect a profit is kind of beside the point. But if it's not a net profit, like if there's Well, in what other kind of profit is there but net profit? Uh, well, oh my so let's say you're having expenses because you're investing in the education, sure. et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the volume of your sales is not necessarily exceeding that of what you've invested in. Then that is not a profit. Uh, profit is income exceeding expenses. Okay. And the opposite, expenses exceeding profit, is called a loss. So how long can you operate at a loss? Good rate? question. <laughs> That's my gross <laughs> now. Slow down. now you can operate at a loss technically indefinitely. But CRA starts to get itchy about it after about three years. Because after three years, if you're running your business and you cannot make more money than you're spending, everybody knows that, that businesses are expensive to start and then they have a certain momentum and you hope to build up to a point, right? You shouldn't be in a business if you don't think that you're going to recover your costs, right? If it takes a couple of years before you're turning a profit, the government has no problem with that. They know. They don't want to kill the idea of entrepreneurialism. But if after three years you're not making a profit, then they start to look at whether you're serious about this. Do you still have a reasonable expectation of profit? And now they're asking over the course of the whole business, do you have the reasonable expectation that you're going to recover all the losses from the previous years and make a profit? Right? That's the question they start to ask. But I would say, if you are doing a business and after three years you're not making a profit and you keep doing it, the, the first person who should be asking you whether you have a reasonable expectation of profit is you. Right? It should, you should be really more worried about this than the government. So if you enjoy doing it and you're willing to like, just sort of like not declare, if you are just sort of like willing to not take the loss, like declare the income, cancel it out with expenses, but not do a negative number, right? They have no argument with that. No argument with that. Because they don't like the negative number. Why don't they like the negative number? Anybody know why? If you have income from somewhere else, let's say you have a job job pays you 30000 and then you have a $10,000 loss in your business, you get taxed on 30000 minus that ten, right? So there's a really good reason for a crooked person to have a loss every year. Right? If that weren't the case, they might not be as concerned about it, right? But they are. So what I tell, sometimes tell clients, there are some clients who are in a kind of business that either takes even longer to turn a profit, or that frankly they'd be doing either way. Every few years, I say, like, let's let it ride. Let's just call it a zero here, because we just don't want to have that negative number hanging around over and over and over again, or we're gonna. That is one of the only red flags that you can actually do when you file your taxes, like that they actually see is that negative number. So, careful of that. Yes? I wanted to know about that. Um, I started freelance in the fall, but I'm still at school and I work on the side, and on the side I do freelance. Okay. So, obviously, I have much more expenses yeah. than income. Yeah. So, and I was told that since I started, like, I don't know, October, that for the first year, I could, like, take 2014 and merge it with 2015 somehow. Um, to balance it a little bit more. I have sometimes done something like that. I don't like to, though. I like to keep things in the calendar here. I mean, I don't even know if there is a really clear mechanism for taking an expense. Because the problem is, the problem is that when you do your taxes, there are technically two ways you can write off your expenses and declare your income. One way is the more correct way. It's called the accrual method which means that you count your income as income when you bill it, regardless of when you get paid. And you count your expense as an expense when they bill you, regardless of when you actually pay it. And that's considered more accurate. When you do that, 
you can sort of shift things around because you can say, well, it's payable back here, and you know, didn't, even though the money didn't come in, you know, the money came in here. But what the other way to do it, which is less exact, but what most people who are a single person business tend to do is like, I spent it here, I expense it here. I collect the money here, I declare the money here, right? When, when the money actually moves. Is it when the money is due to move or when it actually moves? When it actually moves is what people tend to do. The only thing the government has to say on this is that whatever method you choose, you gotta stick with it and be consistent. So if you want to say, well, you know, the expense, well, it, you know, it was incurred, but you know, I'm going to call, I'm going to pay it, but I'm going to pay it with a loan to myself. And like, you can technically you can move things around, but then technically you've made it, you've made it so that you're now doing it the more complicated way, and technically you're supposed to keep doing that. I think if you do it only once, you're going to get away with it. I mean, and by get away with it, I, I don't even mean that as a big deal. It's just like, yeah. They, they kind of let things go, like if it's not going to change your tax bracket or really benefit you in any way. But because it's not really going to benefit you in any way, I'm not really sure why you bother. Don't take the loss, you know. Take it when you take it, you know. And, you know, keep it in the calendar year. It's actually less complicated, you know. As a student, it should be a while before you have to pay any real taxes. Anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Completely different. So what about CPP? What about CPP? CPP is calculated as part of your tax return. So when you get your tax bill, it includes a CPP. And the government is keeping track of what you pay into it, because what you pay into it sort of has an impact as to what you can pull back out. So really it gets taken care of for you. Now the one thing about CPP when you're self-employed, when you are an employee, you pay half of the CPP and the employer pays the other half and the total is 9.9% .9 of your income up to a certain maximum and then you've maxed it out. Every year there's a maximum anybody can pay into CPP and that's it. It comes out about the $44,000 of income, you've paid off all your CPP, you can't pay more into it, you're done. And then you take half, your employer takes half. When you are self-employed, you are the earner and you're the employer, so you pay all of it. And CPP also becomes payable on less income. So everybody gets about $12,000 worth of income that they don't have to pay any income tax on. But the threshold where you have to start paying CPP is 3,500 bucks on your freelance income. But again, that all gets calculated on your income tax return. So you actually don't have to do any math. And when I said that 15 to 20% that you set away aside for your taxes, that includes that. It's just, it's just taken care of it. So, it's not Anything else? Oh, come on, it's only 9 o'clock. Doesn't anybody just want to keep talking about taxes until... It's, it's not even dawn. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any changes this year that have bearing on self-employment? Uh, I haven't really looked into it, you know, to, to, to see the current one because really the, the 20, most people are not doing their 2014 yet because there's, they don't have their slips if they have slips coming in. But, you know, self-employment has changed very, 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 very little. The basic concept of income and expenses and you pay taxes on your profit barely changes. Things have changed. Sometimes stuff about capital expenses, you know, um, there's uh, the way that you write off a thing like a computer is a very gradual thing, and there are rules about that. Those rules are, to change those rules, but every three years. Yeah, with the computers, they change it until they sort of settled into how computers work, right? But there hasn't been a, a real change to that that I know of. Um, Meals and Entertainment used to be able to write off 75%, and that's only 50 because they don't trust you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> But those are the only things that really can change, and the rest is kind of pretty consistent from year to year, and the principles are always the same. So there might have been some changes, I have to admit that I haven't really looked at them, but I haven't been hearing any stuff about, you know, like, like, you know, like tax preparers sit around and drink and tell secrets. Anyway. All right, so I think, okay, so if anybody wants to sign up for my newsletter, where I just send out some tax tips from time to time, uh, there's a clipboard here with a pen, give me your email address, I'll put you on the list. There's also these booklets that include a lot of information that was up here, plus the phone numbers for calling for HST, and a little summary on how the HST works too, including the quick method. It's in here as well, so you don't have to write anything down, or if you can't read your handwriting, if you're like me, um, you're welcome to do that. Uh, and as I say, if you want to give me a call or send me an email with any kind of tax question that you forgot to ask, 
or that you did ask and you've totally forgotten the answer, or you did ask and you pretended to understand the answer, but let's face it, it's just way too much talking. Go ahead and get in touch with me. I'm, I'm always happy, as long as I don't, as long as I can, like, this is why I like the phone and the email because I can keep the bunny slippers on. You know, if I can keep the bunny slippers on, I don't charge. If you want to come in and sit, sit down and talk to me, you're welcome to it, but I got to charge. So if you want to do it for free, just you know, call me or, or email me and I'm happy to answer any of these questions. I do it all the time. I'm happy to do it. My, yeah, my email is on here, my phone number, and plus it's just a handy book. Also, it's teeny, and I find those adorable. But I just, I don't know, I just got to think for little tiny books. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to get that eight-page Deadlines. Eight yeah, you know what, and even the, even this thing has a little section about, has a, a section about paying tax and installments, and it has a little section about the HST, and this is 90% of anything you'd ever need to know about the HST, in this little teeny weeny thing. So, you know, I encourage you, grab it, uh, you know, fight for it, whatever, like I'm, Totally Thunderdome and I don't, it's fine. Uh, and thank you so much for um, paying attention and staying awake for this because, you know, it's, it's late and it's taxes. <laughs>